I think the greatest two lessons that are timeless for all of us to always keep in mind, these are probably the two greatest lessons I think I've learned in my lifetime, and that's this. You ready? There is a God, and I'm not him. And I think it's important for all of us to know. Some of you going, that doesn't seem too deep, but it is sometimes to remember there is a God and we are not him. I am not him. However, throughout history, man will try to plagiarize God. Man will try, humanity will try to slip into the God slot and try to let us think that we have all that we need. It happens in government, it happens in science, it happens in technology, and sadly to say, it even happens in religion. It happens in the church when man tries to plagiarize God. Let me be clear, plagiarism means the practice of taking someone else's work and passing it off as your own. That what God is doing, sometimes people begin to take it off, take it as their own, that they've done it. People will try to do and be what only God can do and be. And sometimes, there's that, just sometimes, God will let men plagiarize him, but only for a few moments. Then God steps up to the plate and says, this is where we differ. This is where God begins to show why he is and we're not. I was thinking about that showdown where God begins to go head to head with men who tried to plagiarize him between a showdown between a shepherd slash fugitive and the most powerful leader on the planet and the most powerful nation. It was between Moses versus Egypt and Pharaoh. It's when Moses came to declare to Pharaoh for the enslaved Israelites for over 400 years, these powerful four words, let my people go. And a showdown takes place. And it's going to be God versus man. And man is going to try to plagiarize God. And it happens on the very first meeting when Moses begins to take a staff and Aaron throws it on the floor by the direction of God. God told them to do this and it would turn into a serpent. Let me read to you on how that showdown happened. And there is a phrase that I want you to see where man tries to step in and compete with God. Look at this with me. Their first meeting in Exodus 7. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did just as the Lord commanded them. And Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Now this next verse is going to lead us into some, into, into the showdown. Then Pharaoh called for the wise men, the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Moses and Aaron threw down a rod, turned into a serpent. The magicians of Egypt did the very same thing. When it's all over, this is what really the score is. Magicians won, God won. But it continues. Look at this. So Moses and Aaron did even as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile, in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. Don't miss this now, Times Square Church. Here it comes. And the Bible says this. So Aaron, uh, so the fish that were in the Nile died, and the Nile became foul, so that the Egyptians could not drink the water from the Nile, and the blood was throughout all the land of Egypt. Here comes verse 22. But the magicians of Egypt did the same thing with their secret arts. Now, folks, this is getting a little scary if you're Moses and Aaron, because now it is magicians to God to. Some God plagiarism is taking place here. But now we go to the third miracle that happens in Egypt. It's the frogs. Look at this. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up, covered the land of Egypt. And I don't know if you knew this about verse 7. The magicians did the same thing with their secret arts, making frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but now it's magicians three, God three. 
And if I'm Moses and Aaron, I have two thoughts running through my mind back to our, two, our, our original lesson. Maybe there is no God and maybe these guys could be God that you're thinking we're at this point, it's three to three. And truth be told, if I'm Aaron, I'd be looking at Moses cross-eyed going, now why are we here? And who told you where to come? And I told you not to be talking to bushes in the wilderness. And because we're here now, it's three, three. What do we do at this point? But then it happened, folks. As if God was playing with the magicians, always keep this in mind. God always outdistances himself from humanity. God will always show that he is God and we are not. Here's where it comes. It's, it's man can only go just so far. And this is the part that I want you to see. Verse 16 of chapter eight. Then the Lord said to Moses and say to Aaron, stretch out your staff. Now, I don't want you to miss this. This is the fourth miracle. Strike the dust of the earth, the dirt and the dust of the earth, that it may become gnats, flies throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, look at this. They did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast, and all the dust of the earth became gnats throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, folks, here it comes. This is where man gets outdistanced by God. God lets him plagiarize him to some point, and then finally God steps in and says, I'm God and you're not. Here it comes. The magicians, what's the next word? What's the next word? The magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats from the dust. But look at this. But they could not. So that there were gnats on man and beast. And can I just add to the scriptures here? On man and beast and gnats on the magicians. And then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. At that moment, God just gave them the realization. There is a God and they are not him. How did they know that? Ready for this time, Square Church? Because here's the issue. There is not a person on the planet that could put wings on dirt. There is no one, only God can say to dust, put a respiratory system inside of it. Only God can put retinas and eyeballs inside of dirt. Only God can put muscles and breath. Only God could put a brain, a reproductive system, and a digestive system it's only God. Let's see a magician do that. Let's see the Pharaoh do that. Let's see the most powerful nation on the planet do that. It's impossible because what God was doing, there's an old Latin phrase called ex nihilo, which means out of nothing and from nothing. It means that God was able to speak to nothing and bring life out of it. God was able to look at dirt and dust because he is the God that makes something come out of nothing. He takes dirt and brings it to life. If you don't understand that, it's called creation. Genesis chapter one and two, that we were dust and God breathed his breath into the dirt of this ground and brought forth life. No man can do that. I don't believe, let me just be clear for those that are online and watching here, I don't believe in a big bang theory. I believe in a big God theory. I believe that God is able to take nothing and bring something out of it. His voice, just like he did in Genesis chapter one, he looked at dirt and said, fly. Look at that folks, because nobody can do that. And I have to tell you, it was at that point that all of a sudden those magicians said, this is the finger of God. It was the gnat miracle, the bug miracle that all of a sudden when God takes nothing and makes something out of it. Some of you listening today, maybe haven't gotten to your gnats and, and bugs yet. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? That we're still trusting in, in, in people that can do the blood and the frog tricks and duplications. But there is coming a point, I'm telling you folks, with everyone in this room, everyone that's listening online, there comes a point that you need something out of nothing. It's an impossible situation. Man can't do it. Only God can step in and do it. 
It's when God begins to step in. When you think, man, I've lost my job. How am I going to pay the rent? How am I going to even have enough when according to my ledger and according to the balance sheet, it doesn't even work? How is this going to happen when, when these things are all turning against me? I'm telling you, there's not a man on this planet that can promise you enough, give you enough, and get you through. Only God can take nothing and bring something out of that very thing. That's what those magicians of Egypt learned. They were trying to plagiarize God. They were trying to keep up with God. They were trying to do God things without God in their life. They were trying to act like God, plagiarizing him. And sad to say that's where we are as a country today. And I'm telling you, we are fast approaching the gnats. That governments and science, technology, and even religion are running out of their God duplications and their God counterfeits. That for a while we're able to do frogs and snakes, but pretty soon it's going to be over because our country, our city needs for God to show up and do what only God can do. Our country and New York City and the city that you're from needs now God to show up because now we're faced with nothing in front of us and the only one that can bring something out of nothing is God himself. That's what he does. That's the ex nihilo. That's, the, that's God breathing life into something that doesn't exist. And there's plagiarizers, God plagiarizers all over. Those magicians that seem to pop up. Can I tell you what seems to be the biggest magician today? Here it is. This is like the biggest magician today. I'm telling you. It boasts of so much. The, the, the number one thing I was reading about is these mental health apps that now people are using to get by. It's this billion dollar business and it's called, this is what made me laugh. It's called self-help. Can I just tell you something? I, I, I'm not a self-help guy. I'm more of a God help me guy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I am. It's much cheaper just to do a God help me in, in, in my situation. And, and I was reading an article on the top 22 mental health apps for stress, anxiety, and more. It says, looking for greater peace of mind? There's an app for that. Apps for stress, depression, anxiety, and sleep, all at the touch of your finger. I want to go, now you have just plagiarized God. Because what you're telling me is that by the touch of a finger, I'm going to get peace, I'm going to get sleep, I'm going to lose anxiety, and I'm going to lose depression. Mm -mm. Unless you can put wings on gnats, I don't believe you. I know what it's going to cost me, $9.99 a month, and I'm going to forget about it. And then when I, by the time three years later I realize I paid all this money and I'm still stressed out, um, I'm going to realize what happened because that doesn't belong to the phone. It doesn't belong to an app. It doesn't belong to, 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 to anybody else. Those things, the deliverance from peace, the, for, for peace and the deliverance from anxiety and sleep, that give, God only can give that. Let me, let me just say this. Do you need peace today? Do you need peace today? Don't, don't get a nap. Don't get a nap. Here it is. The Bible says this. He will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in him and whose thoughts turn often to the perfect peace. You got anxieties? Here it comes. 1 Peter 5, 7. Turn all your anxiety over to God because he cares for you. Thank God. How about this one? Do you need sleep? Some of you have been listening to seagulls and seals and oceans and, and all this stuff for the last three years. You're going like, turn that on and here's the ocean and now I'm feeling this. Let, let me tell you this. You need sleep? Here it comes. Proverbs 3. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Why? Have no fear of sudden disaster for the Lord, hallelujah, will be at your side. Thank God for that. I'm telling you, I'm saving you a lot of money. Here it is. Are you discouraged? Don't get an app. Here it comes. David says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart sad? Put your hope in God and I'll praise him again, my savior and my God. That I'm telling you, when you sang today with the choir, when you sang with the team today, I'm telling you, it fights the discouragement. 
How about worry? Here it comes. Are you worrying? The Bible says this, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has already done. Thank you, God. And while men are trying to put wings on dust and make it fly, changing, charging you monthly for ocean sounds and mantras, only God can give you rest. God can give you sweet sleep. God can give you peace. God can give you joy, remove anxiety, and only God can get rid of depression. It is God that is able to do that. That's why I believe these words. Listen to me. God can take the place of anything, but nothing can take the place of God. The magicians start to come and try to plagiarize. And there was another New Testament magician, another magician in the New Testament. His name was Simon. Simon seems to come show up at a time that God is starting to move and trying to introduce that plagiarism. I noticed something about the New Testament or the book of Acts that was very interesting to me. When I started to read the book of Acts, it seems that every time God was starting to do something, the magician showed up. In Acts 13, when Paul goes on his first missionary journey, the very first city he goes to, a magician shows up named Bar-Jesus, Eliamus, who shows up that Paul has to confront. When revival comes to Ephesus in Acts 19, the magicians show up that all of a sudden there's the showdown in, in Acts 19. And then again here in Acts chapter 8, that God is doing something, and it seems that these magicians keep showing up, and Simon was going to encounter Philip, the Holy Spirit evangelist, just like the Egyptian magicians encountered the anointed deliverer Moses. See, a revival takes place in Samaria, and whenever God is doing something, men will always try to come in and bring that counterfeit. I want you to jot this down. It, it, is, it is not on the screen, but I want you to get this. Anytime you see a counterfeit, it means the original is close by. Let me say that again. Anytime you see a counterfeit, the original is close by. And that was what Moses faced in Pharaoh's court. That's what is happening here in Samaria as a revival is taking place there. A revival happens. And even this man named Simon, this magician, the Bible says, believes in Jesus. But something powerful happens. The work of grace is not done yet. And this is important, and it's going to be important for us here at Times Square Church because something powerful is about to head their way to all those that believed on Jesus. They, were been believed, they believed, and then they were water baptized. But the apostles heard about this revival and said, we need to go there and pray for them for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, I want to pause here for a moment, and I want to challenge you to join us for something. Um, I, in August, next month, we are going to take four days of prayer and fasting as a church. That before we head back into September and students head back to school and schedules start to readjust after the summer vacation, on August 21st, through the 24th, that Times Square Church is going to have a season of prayer and fasting. Three nights of in-person, and the fourth night, we'll be, we're going to ask you to either join online or drive up to our summit campus in Pennsylvania, by Hershey, Pennsylvania, and, and to join the fourth night. We'll be up there, but we'll do three nights in person here. Let me explain to you what was going to happen on those nights, because the first night, on Sunday night, we're going to do something we have not done before. Um, or since the pandemic, is on August 21st, which is Sunday night, we are going to, we're, we're going to ask you to go to the 10 o'clock or the one o'clock service, go eat something, and then we're going to say, come back at six o'clock. We're going to reopen the doors at six o'clock, choir, worship. Our friend Cece Winans is going to be here and lead us in worship on that night. And then here's the most important part. On that first night, that we are going to, we're going to worship together, choir, Cece, 
Then I'm going to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we are going to lay hands on every man, woman, myself, the elders, the leaders. And we are going to pray like they did on the day of Pentecost for fire to come down and for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to come to this place. So we're going to tell you when the one o'clock service is over, go get something to eat and show up here because the next three days you'll be fasting. So eat good. And then what we're going to do is this. Then we're going to come back the next night. We're going to be right back here in the sanctuary in person. And we are going to, so the first night will be the power of the Holy Spirit. The second night, we are going to be believe for the power of healing. We are going to anoint with oil. And those, I don't care whether you have cancer or diabetes, migraines or back pains, a disc has slipped. You bring people. We are believing in faith that God is going to heal people. We're believing. So if they're in the balcony, we'll have oil. we're going to anoint people with oil. We're going to preach faith that night and believe that we we believe in the God that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That He can heal you today. And we're going to believe for God to do that. And then on Tuesday night, the most important night, parents, I want you to get this on, on night three. It's the power to stand. We are going to pray and lay hands on every student, whether they're in elementary school, junior high, high school, or college. We are going to pray that God give them the power to stand. Then we're going to lay hands on every teacher, every professor. I don't care whether you drive a bus or you serve cafeteria food. We're going to pray that God touch you for this new school year and a new anointing and a new power to come upon you. And then over at our summit campus, night four is going to be the power for deliverance. We're believing that God is going to break addictions and habits and sin cycles. You come, may come from a family that everybody is getting divorced and nobody has a healthy marriage. We're going to believe that God is going to break that. And God is going to do something in your family and in your life that God is going to break those things. Because I believe that where the spirit of the Lord is, like we have said, there is freedom. There is liberty that's going to happen. Power of the Holy Spirit, power of healing, the power to stand, and the power of deliverance, all found in the name of Jesus. No magician, no religion can do that. No preacher, no pastor, only God can do those things. But here's what happened. We believe that, but something didn't click in Simon, who the Bible says believed, and it seems that he was baptized, and this is what happened when the apostles had their night one of the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Here it comes, folks. For he had not yet fallen on them. He had only, they have only simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's water baptism. Then they began laying hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. That's why you may be here today and you, you're born again and you've been water baptized. But we're going to pray for a new power for you to be endued with a new power from heaven uh, as, in, in, this, in this season. But look at this. It says, now when Simon, this is the magician, when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, look at this now. He offered the money saying, give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. That all of a sudden he has discovered that he thinks that, his, that this plagiarism that Simon thought, if I have money and if I know the method, I can do the God thing. Don't miss this, folks. Anytime you see a counterfeit, the original is close by. And here's the danger. Churches and even Christians think if that we have money and we know a method, we can bring God into a room. That's Simon's theology. That's Simon's theology. That money and method brings heaven. Nothing could be further from the truth. Anybody who thinks that you can buy the power of God or just do A, B, and C, and all these people are going to come and get saved, folks, God is not in the control of man. Let me remind you, there is a God, and we are not him. God comes. It's called the sovereignty of God. He comes when he wants to come. We just want to be ready when he does come. And that's why Simon thought, if I just give the right amount of money, if I give cash and know the method of laying on of hands. Folks, I've been there. 
I've tried to, in 40 years of ministry, I've tried to play, I've had my moments of thinking, oh, this is the way it works. This is the method. This is how God comes. I remember when I was in Detroit, we lived right near my, my home that I was renting with, with some guys was right near the projects in Detroit where we were for some 30 years. And so I remember coming home one night after an, a church service. And as I was coming home from church service, it was probably late at night and there was, a, there was a convenience store right outside the projects and it wasn't a safe area. Our, where we lived wasn't a safe area near the Jeffries Projects in downtown Detroit. And, and I, but I was thirsty and I said, we have nothing at the house. We've been in church all day and all night. Let me just stop and get something. And, and as I pulled up, I saw a gentleman waiting at the door and, and he didn't look dangerous, but I knew he was gonna ask me for money. And I said, God, I don't want to give him money. I don't have much money. And um, I did ask this. I said, God, sincerely, I said, God, give me a word for this man. So I got out of the car. I was going to go in and just get a bottle of soda or something. And as I was getting out of that car, that man approached me and said, hey, I need $2 for a bus fare to go from Detroit to Pontiac. And the Lord dropped the word in my heart. And I looked at that man. I said, I'm going to give you two bucks. I said, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you're lying to me, I'm going to pray like Ananias and Sapphira that God kill you at my feet right now. Now, folks, I have to tell you, I thought I was going to be the one that dies at that point right there. As I looked at him, I thought, what did I just say? And the man looked at me and he said, I'm lying. He goes, he goes, would you pray for me? And I go, oh, thank you, Jesus. I laid hands on that man. I prayed this prayer of deliverance. I prayed, oh, God. And I was thanking God that I was still there and still alive. But here, let me tell you what I did. Man, I, I thought to myself, I got it. I got anyone in the city of Detroit that asks me for money is going to hear about Ananias and Sapphira. This is the line. This is it. God, you gave it to me and I can use it on everybody now. I'm telling you that the, 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 the heaven, heaven knows this is true. Three days later, I showed up at the church and a man was waiting outside the door and he had a gas can in his hand. And he looked at me and goes, hey, pastor, I've been waiting for you. And I'm thinking in my mind, I've been waiting for you. And he looked at me and he goes, hey, I need $5. My car broke down. My car ran out of gas on the highway. And so I had it. I already, I knew what God already spoke. I have the universal word for every beggar that asked me for money. And I looked at him. I said, I said, I'm going to give you $5. I said, but if you're lying to me, I'm going to pray like Ananias and Sapphira that you die and go to hell and the fire and the gas in that can is going to make it more intense. And I said, I want you to know that right now. And the, and he is staring at me. And he goes, this is what he said. He goes, I still need the $5. I thought to myself, it didn't work. Can I tell you why it didn't work? Because God is not beholden to our methods that we come up with. God is sovereign. That folks, I'm telling you, he doesn't need a church that just figured out some methods and has some money. He needs a church that knows how to call upon God is what God needs. I'm telling you, listen to me, Times Square Church. Those online, listen to me. There is a battle coming for the churches in America. There is a battle coming for the churches that are already coming to churches all over the world. And in this battle, we don't need methods from men. We need miracles from God. We don't need someone that came, comes up with, say this line and do this line, and then God shows up. We don't need that today. I know what God has spoken to me about warning the church about a coming persecution. And while churches are playing with frogs and playing with, 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 with serpents and snakes, 
While churches are trying to bring God with money and methods, we need a church that calls on God, that says, God, we need you to show up. We need you to do what we can't do. We need you to come and put wings on dirt because we don't know how to do that, God. That, Father, we've plagiarized you enough. We're not God. Only you are, and you are able to do miracles. So here's what it is. Hands off, Simon. Don't touch the work of the Holy Spirit. Hands off, magicians of, of excellence. In his seven and eight. You can't do what only God can do. And I tell you, preachers, I tell me, get your hands off the things of God and let God do what only God can do. We don't need methods and money. We need a Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. One of our leaders who sits over to the left in our 10 o'clock service sent this to me a few days ago. He said, I had partial hearing loss in my right ear for many years. Sounds would come across, would come to me, and it would be all muffled in conversations and gatherings. I couldn't hear anything. In fact, in those situations, I would just nod my head and pretend I heard what they were saying, and I couldn't hear. He said, I'm in a profession that needs for me to understand because it's so precise, the profession that he's in. He said, so I would look at people and nod my head and when I heard nothing because I didn't want to be rude to them. It was one of those things I learned to live with. I didn't even go to the doctor for it. And he said, fast forward to a few months ago, sitting here in a Times Square church service, I was in the sanctuary and he says, I remember the sermon. Pastor Tim preached on an inner man's strength even when the outer man is decaying. He said a little while after he spoke about having appointments scheduled with his doctors for medical issues, he said at one point, and I remember this, he said he clapped his hands and immediately I felt, he said, my ear opened up. He said, at first I thought there was a glitch in the sound system that the volume went up. He said, I, I realized it wasn't, everything was the same. He said, my ear opened up after a decade. I tried to get my wife's attention, but the preaching just kept going on. And the rest of the service, I felt amazed at God's love, that God would show up, even when I didn't even expect it, that God would show up. Folks, listen to me. It wasn't these hands. It wasn't my clapping. That's, uh, if that was it, I'd be clapping on every one of you right now today. That that's man's method. My hands are nothing. You know what that was? That was God's hand that was upon his life that opened up his ears. That's what that was. Any person to think, well, this is the way it works. I clap my hands or I say this line or I spend this money and I use this method. It's God that does it. We have to give glory to him. We take our hands off the glory of God. We don't sit there and go, now I know. Now I figured it out. We give glory to God every single time. God moves in the service. We give glory to God. Someone's healed. We give glory to God. People get saved. We give glory to God for those things. Some years ago, Tom Hanks and Ronnie Howard did an amazing movie called Apollo 13 and began to speak about the, the, the catastrophe that almost took the lives of three astronauts in space on their moon mission. In 1970, as the Apollo 13 was on its way to the moon, literally some technical difficulties and, and all three men were on the verge of losing their life in, re, in, re, in real life. The president of the United States came on TV while NASA is trying to figure out how do we get the moon landing is off? How do we get our astronauts home? And our president came on TV and asked this country, asked the nation to pray for the safe return for the astronauts. President Nixon said, pray, pray that God would intervene. The capsule miraculously landed in the Pacific Ocean. All three astronauts lived. They were put on an aircraft carrier. And when those astronauts were safely aboard that carrier, the president of the United States praised American technology and NASA for the return of our astronauts. He asked us to pray, but wouldn't give thanks to the hand of God that did this. Folks, I'm grateful for those that have their hands in technology. God has given you a gift, but let's just be honest here that you can just do so much. 
You have just enough of mine. It's God that stepped in. He asked us to pray. And when God answered the prayer, he praised human skill and technology. Is it any wonder that just a few years later that a, that a, that a, that a crime occurred called Watergate? The president praised the wrong hands. He praised the wrong hands. Let me be clear to those that God has given a sinking mind to. Whatever industry you're in, whether finance or science, whether you're in technology, whether you're in Broadway, listen to me. Whether you have your PhD or your MBA, look at me, it's still G-O-D. Only God can do those things. Don't ever think, don't ever think I did this myself. I put myself through college. Oh, hold on one second. Who gave you the eyes to see those, that blackboard? Who, who, who gave you the legs to walk? If, if my recollection says that he put some legs on dirt, he put a brain in your dirt, he went ahead and put a respiratory system in your dirt. He may have even given some of you, for some of us dirt people, he may have even given you a scholarship. But let me just tell you something. Don't forget where it came from. Because when you no matter, I don't care if you're on, on, on Wall Street and God has gifted you to make money. That's a gift. But I want you to listen to me. Don't forget where that, where that came from. He told the children of Israel, listen to it. He said, in the wilderness, he said, he fed you manna, which your fathers didn't know, that he might humble you and test you and do good for you. And then here it comes now, folks. And he said this, otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made this well, but you are going to remember the Lord your God. It is he who is giving you power to make wealth. You didn't get that on your own. God showed up. God did it. Don't plagiarize God. Don't plagiarize him and think you did it. He was telling that the children of Israel, just because you got blessed, don't think that's you. Don't get, take your hands off that. Take your hands off whenever there's success. Only God can do it. In fact, let me remind you from the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, what do you have that God hasn't given to you? He says, everything you have, that's a gift from God. And if everything you have is from God, why boast? Is it that if, if it was like, like it's not a gift. Pastors and preachers in, in religion and seminaries and Bible schools have forgotten there is no formula to bring the Holy Ghost. That's Simon. Lay hands and give money. Lay hands and give money. If you're operating a church by a church formula, be careful because that gets man's fingerprints on things. Man has forgotten. Times I've forgotten. Take your hand off the church. It's not your church. It's God's church. Heaven didn't come from the apostles' hands in Acts 8. Heaven came to a praying people abandoned to God in an upper room in Acts chapter 2. That's where God showed up. Let me close with this. Let, let's, let's, let's finish here. I want musicians to come. We need their hands to play something. Um, there's something I've been doing for the last two years since the pandemic started. I have started for the last two years I try to do every day. It doesn't turn out every day, but many days of the week, I walk through the streets of this city that I love, praying that God would send revival, praying, praying that God, I walk through communities. I walk through places. I just go, God, save people. Do something special. Do something here. I pray for a revival in our city. I pray for a revival in our nation. I just finish listening that I want to encourage every one of you to go to YouTube. And it's, and if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, it'll help you because you can get the, you can get the, the alerts when it comes on. Um, I got the alert when pastor Carter spoke a powerful message on Wednesday night at the worldwide prayer meeting. It's called perversion at the school house door church. I'm just telling you, It is so sobering. Pastor Carter had had an insight, brought us all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, the last straw, the last marker before judgment comes upon a country, as it did on Sodom and Gomorrah, is is when perversion starts knocking on the door 
and we as parents are surrendering our children to it. I'm telling you, it was sobering, it was frightening, but there is a truth, there is something there that broke my heart because it's true. We're watching it take place. And I kept thinking, God, what about our city? What about our country? Pastor, Pastor Carter started to, to talk about what is taking place that when that perversion hits, he says they, they no longer, this, this is what's in the message. He, he says they no longer, um, we, even for what, what people are doing, what adults are doing to children, this, this, this criminal act of moral perversion for children, there's a new language now. They call it minor attractions now. That's the new word, minor attraction, almost to soften it. That's, that's how sick our, our country is becoming, folks. This is where we live. My heart broke, and I, and I sat, and I walked, and, you know, and I was praying, and Pastor Carter told me, he said, he said this to me, and he goes, he goes, Tim, the way our country is going, the way what is happening, it, it, the, the only remedy is a revival. The only remedy, and if you don't know what the word revival is, it is it's just an outpouring of God that begins to turn the tide of what's happening, to turn, to turn a city, a country back to God, to send it back to its moorings, back to its, 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 its intent that we have been created in the image of God. And man, science, technology, government, religion has plagiarized God as if, as if they know. And boy, are we in a time that we need God to bring something out of nothing. We need God to show up. He said these sobering words to me. He says, Tim, the way things are going without a revival. He said, thinking about the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ. He said, do you understand? He said, and this is what was sobering to me. He goes, the way things are going, you could actually be the last pastor of Times Square Church because of where things are going. Because of, because of this, of our society, folks, we need a move of God. And as I walked the streets, I, I found myself on the Upper West Side and I sat down on a bench near Lincoln Center in Columbus Avenue, I sat on a bench. My heart was broken. And I, and I have to tell you, I felt a little bit hopeless that moment. And I'm telling you, I heard it. I I had my magician with me, and I recorded it. I recorded it. I was sitting there, put my hands and my head on a bench going, God, what, what, where are we heading? I started praying for Sunday. I started praying for 212 as Grant and Emily. You'll see Grant leading us in worship. He is the one with the guitar. You'll see Emily over here. Grant and Emily lead 212 with Stan and Natasha every Friday night. And I started praying for them. I go, what are these kids? What are my children going to face? My four kids, what are they going to face? And in this moment of hopelessness, I'm telling you, I heard this faint sound. I heard it and recorded it. A few blocks away, it's six o'clock. And the chimes are going off at a church, six o'clock. And just before the chimes go off, it starts playing this song. And I'm telling you, tears started from my hands started. Be, and I quickly got my phone and I said, this is a God moment. I need to remember this. And folks, in this moment, sort of playing a hymn from the 1940s that was written when World War II started. And the bells were ringing. Let me, let me get, there wasn't singing the words, but the bells were ringing. And these were the lyrics that I knew because I started singing them. The bells started ringing, oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout Hallelujah, the universe displayed. And then those bells started to ring. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, 
my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Hallelujah. At that moment, I'm telling you, I was listening to it in prayer this morning. You hear the bells sing in, in, in the midst. There's, there's even one part, and you know it's, it's, it's in a park because some dad is yelling at his kid. But there is that moment where the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, I can do this. I realized at that moment, I don't need a magician. I don't need a method. I don't need money. I need God to show up. I need for God to come through. I need for God to do this. Oh, my goodness. And I just kept thinking, how great is our God? 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 Folks, I'm just telling you, there's no money, there's no method that these hands, there's nothing magical about this. God has to show up. God has to do it. Can I just give you, I'm just going to read it to you. I'm going to give you challenges. Here it is. TSC challenges. Here's the first one. Number one is this. Be a blessing to people, but don't, but don't be God to people. Can I, can I just remind you, God can do himself just fine. He doesn't need you being God. He doesn't need you being deliverer and provider. God can do what he needs to do. He knows how to convict. He knows how to save. That's why I want you to always remember this. God without man is still God, but man without God is nothing. Don't miss that today. Number two, don't confuse the power of men with the omnipotence of God. Men can do some things. Don't mistake in me. But only God can do everything. Listen, these men are gifted. When I see them play, when I see them all play, they're gifted. There's a gifting that's here. But they, their hands can't bring the presence of God. God shows up when he wants to show up. We, it, it's God that gets the glory. We don't glorify Devon. We don't glorify Brett. We don't glorify man. We say, God, it's you that comes. It's, it's my weakness. It, it, man can do some things, but only God can do everything. This is one of my favorite things. One old Baptist preacher said it like this. Get this down. He said, the Lord has the strength. I have the weakness. So we teamed up, and it's an unbeatable combination. <laughs> Folks, hey, get your phones out. Take a picture of that. You need to get that and remind yourself. The Lord has the strength. I have the weakness, so we teamed up. It's an unbeatable kind. Anybody else teamed up with God with your weakness and took God's strength on? I'm telling you, you're looking at teammate number one right here. I'm weak. He's strong. We make a good team, God. And you know what? He gets all the glory. This is for us. And if you're listening, if you're a leader and listening, let it be for you. But I'm just telling you this for us. Churches that don't pray will plagiarize. Churches that will not seek God. I'm so thankful for our general overseer and leading us every Wednesday night. I'm so thankful for our seasons of prayer and fasting. Because when you don't get wisdom from heaven, you seek it from the methods of man. When you don't get wisdom from heaven, you'll get the methods of man. So instead of Simon going to an upper room in prayer, he's looking at the methods of man. This is the low point, the lowest common denominator. Folks, you got to get this verse down. It's one of the last things ever said in all of Holy Scripture, and it's Revelation 22. Listen to these words. This is my heartbeat for this church. The Spirit and the bride say come. Do you know what that means? The Spirit and the bride. The church is called the bride. You know what that means? It means the Holy Spirit and his church, here it comes, here it comes, the Holy Spirit and his bride, his church, say the same thing at the same time. I, if heaven says come, I want to say come. If heaven says go, I want to say go. If heaven says pray, then let's pray. I don't want to be out of step with heaven. What is heaven saying to us? And let's do what heaven says. That's what God wants us to do. And finally, I can do a lot of things, but I can't do the most important and the ultimate thing. I can't get myself to heaven. These hands can't get me there. God is the only one that can get us there, folks. We can't get ourselves to heaven. If I was to ask you how to get to heaven, it's amazing how many people glorify their hands. It's amazing. I, 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 we, we put heaven in our hands. Well, I'm going to do better. I'm going to stop this. 
I'm going to start to do this. You know what the greatest temptation for us is? The greatest temptation for salvation is to smuggle our character into the work of grace. It's to smuggle our character and going, God, I'm a good person. Why are you going to heaven? Because I haven't hurt anybody. Why are you going to heaven? Because I go to church. Why you? It's smuggling our character. Can I just remind you of something the first president of Princeton University said, Jonathan Edwards? Look at these words. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. <laughs> That's your contribution. If you want to know what you contributed to salvation, your sin. That's, yeah, take glory for that. Folks, the only thing I contributed getting to heaven is my sin. And then God's hands is able to take it from there. Listen, let me explain it to you like this. You ready for this? A basketball in these hands is worth about 29 bucks. But a basketball in LeBron James's hand is worth about $30 million. It all depends on whose hand it's in. A baseball in my hands is worth about 10 bucks, but a baseball in Aaron Judge's hands is worth about $20 million. It depends whose hands it's in. A rod in my hands will keep away a wild dog, but a rod in Moses' hands will open up the Red Sea. It depends on whose hands it's in. A slingshot in my hand is a kid's toy, but put a slingshot in David's hands, it's a mighty weapon to take down a giant. It all depends on whose hands it's in. Two fishes and five loaves of bread ends up being a good fish sandwich for me, but two fishes and five loaves in the hands of the Son of God can feed 5,000 people. It depends on whose hands it's in. Hey, nails and hammer in my hands may fix something in my apartment, but nails in the hands of Jesus will save a planet, set you free, and get you ready to go to heaven. It all depends whose hands it's in. My life is in your hands today, Jesus. Get it out of your hands. Stop plagiarizing God. You don't have enough to get yourself to heaven. You're not that good. Neither am I. You can't get there on your own. If you think you're plagiarizing Jesus, like, like all of a sudden you're able to get us there. You can't. Jesus said this, no man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they're born again. So how do you do that? You can't do that. I can't do that. Oh, it's the work of God. He's the one that does it. And today, let Jesus save you. Let Jesus change you from the inside out. How do you get to heaven? Well, I'm a good person. Well, I haven't done this. I haven't done Those are all good things. That doesn't get you there. I wish it did. But your hands can't do it. But your life in Jesus' hands changes you for eternity. That can happen right now. Pastor Tim, how does that take place? How does that happen? Jesus calls it being born again. He says, this is what Jesus said. He tells this image. It's like, it, it says this. It's like, if, as you were born for the first time physically, you have to be born a second time spiritually. And that happens by the work of God's hands, not us. We can't, we can't born again ourselves. You can't. So how does it happen? A, B, C. That's that simple. A, it's admitting I'm a sinner. All of us are broken on the inside. All of us, starting with me, have a condition called sin. Can't fix it on my own. There's not a promise I can make, a pastor or a priest I can see. There's not a synagogue, a mosque, a program that can fix my sin condition. That's man's hands. Any person, program, phone app, that thinks they can fix your condition, is plagiarizing God. They're plagiarizing God. They can't fix it. Folks, the only person that can fix it is the one that puts wings on dirt, turns dirt into gnats, and the magicians can't do it. Only God can save us today. We have to admit that we're a sinner. Be believing that God sent his son Jesus to die in my place, become my sin bearer. And see, confessing him as Lord, saying, you're in charge of my life now. You're the one. These hands can't do it, but your hands can. Those hands that died for me are the hands that I need on my life today. 
I want you to stand with me. Let's all stand as we close today. Do you know what God did for us in the first service? It's going to sound, but it was a gift. It was a frustrating gift, wasn't it, Freddie? But it was a gift. Juan, our monitor sound, it was frustrating, but it was a gift. Francisco, it was a gift. Let me tell you what the gift was. Everything, we couldn't even go online. Every piece of technology shut down, went haywire. Freddie screamed with no microphone worship for us. Screamed it. He was soaking wet. He's full of sweat, then hugged me. <laughs> it was, it was, God did it. You know why, you know why God did it for Freddie and I and for our church? It's to show us I can shut all this down and I can shut everything down. And as long as my presence is here, that's all that matters. As long as my presence is here. He did it. I watched him and these musicians and these singers. They backed off and just let the Holy Spirit move. That's all they did. Sometimes their mics worked, sometimes they didn't, sometimes the keyboard worked, and sometimes it didn't. So if you saw them, and if you were here for the first service and saw them standing there, it wasn't that they didn't know the song. They, didn't, they, had, they couldn't do anything. They didn't know what to do. But you know what? The Holy Spirit knew what to do. That's what he needed. And it was God teaching us today. We, I mean, there wasn't one song we sang in that first service that was on the list. We, we, we couldn't, it was God going, you, you're not in control. I can do whatever I want to do. There's not a method of money. That's Simon theology. None of that, none of that. And we watched the power of God settle in this place in that first service. Listen, we're, we're not addicted to chaos here. We're not going like, hey, God, break everything down. So the spirit of God, that's just as dumb as relying upon money and methods is to think that God only comes in chaos is as dumb as thinking God only comes with money and methods. God comes when he wants to come. That's what it is. And some of you are here today because God worked it out providentially for you to be here today. Your life could be changed today. Everybody looking around, every head up, because this is one of the most important decisions you can make. I want to pray a prayer of being born again, saying, God, I take my hands off my own life. I need your hands. I need your hands. I need for you to change me, God. I want to be born again. I want my life changed. I want this to be the beginning of a brand new day for me. Wherever you're at, however you got here, maybe you have been coming or maybe this is your first time, but I'm telling you, God set you up today and brought you here today. And if you're here and say, Pastor Tim, would you just, would you, would you pray that born again prayer? Would you include me? I want, I, I need, I, I figured out that when my hands are in charge and my hands do this, I don't have enough. I can't make dirt fly. I can't call something out of nothing. Only God can do that. And if God will take my life, I give it to him today. And when you pray that prayer to be born again, I want to be part of that. If that's you, God set you up today to bring you here. With that, no hesitation. If you say, would you put me in that prayer today? If you could put me in that prayer, would you just hold up your hand and say, put me in that prayer today. Hold it, hold it up as high as you can. I want to make sure, man, a whole row here. That's fantastic. Keep them up. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, gotcha, eight, nine. Keep them up. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Keep them up. I want to make sure I see eight. Got gotcha you in the back. 18, 19, 20. That's fantastic. 21. You can put your hands down. Thank God for all of you. Here's what I'd love to do. Listen, we're family here. We're, listen, we're all, we've all learned to get our life out of our own hands. If you've raised your hand, would you do me a favor? I want to pray for you. Would you just get out of your seat? Walk right down here right now. Come on. Our, our workers are going to be here wherever you're at. Just come down. People are going to cheer for you and clap. And if you should have raised your hand, you could still come down. Come on. I want you to make your way down here. This is going to be a moment for you that God is going to do something special. Come on. I want you to make your way down here. Those in this section, my friends in the back, wherever you're at in this place, this is going to be moment. Come on. Come on up close because God is going to do something special for your life. It is my joy that I get a chance to pray with you. I get a chance to pray with you. Those tears, those, that's, that's God. That's, that's God. God brought you here today. What, what's your name? Reggie? And how old are you? 
55 years old. And you brought him here today. Reggie, I'm so, this is your friend. Thank God these are good friends that would bring you today. You're weeping today because God's going to change you from the inside out. That's what that is. I'm so thankful that all of you are here today. Those tears. That's God. Are you guys related? No, just came together? Your brother, your brother brought you in the back. Oh, the bro- you're a good brother. You bring, bring them here. You're a good brother and you're a good friend. And brought both of you? You're by yourself? And you're by yourself. And he gave you a hand. I'm so, th- and I'm, are you guys brothers? Yeah, you look exactly the same. And so, listen, this is a miracle that God has brought all of you here today. This is a new day for you, and we're so excited. And listen, know what you're saying? God, take it. I, I've been in control all the time. Now, God, I want your hands to come on me. I want, your, I want you to touch my life. I want you to take, take over from here. God's going to do it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray with me. We're all going to pray this together. Can we, can we pray together today that God would just do this work? Come on, and we'll all pray it. Say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Okay, let's say this loud now. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.